Ever wonder what makes a museum visit truly great? Not just, you know, for you, but for the museum itself. Yeah. Today, we're going behind the scenes. We're going to explore how museums actually measure the quality of your experience. Yeah, you might be surprised to learn that museums actually study your experience in detail. Really? Yeah, because they've realized just how essential it is to their success. That's so interesting. They even have a special system for it. They do. Called the Overall Experience Rating, or the OER. Right. So whether you're a museum lover or a professional in the field, or even just someone who's fascinated by how these cultural institutions work, this deep dive is going to unpack the OER yeah. and give you a whole new perspective on what makes a museum visit truly memorable. And I think what's interesting about the OER is that it's designed specifically for museums. You know, it goes beyond just asking, like, did you like it? Right. And tries to delve into deeper aspects of what makes a visit enriching and engaging. OK, so let's get into it. What is the core concept behind this OER thing? Well, at its heart, the OER is all about measuring quality of experience, Okay. which recognizes that every visitor brings their own unique perspective and background and expectations to a museum. Meaning there's no one-size-fits-all approach to a great museum visit. Yeah, exactly. A simple thumbs up or thumbs down just doesn't really capture the complexity of a museum experience. Okay, I'm intrigued. Mm -hmm. So how does the OER actually work in practice? Well, the OER relies on four key dimensions. Oh, here we go. Yeah, a little academic, but we'll break it down. Subjective, user-centric, holistic, and multidimensional. Okay, those sound pretty academic. Can you break those down first? Yeah, absolutely. So subjective simply means that it acknowledges the personal nature of experience. Okay. So your feelings and perceptions are what matter most. User-centric means the focus is on the visitor. Okay. Not the museum's agenda. Holistic means that we're looking at the entire experience, not just isolated parts, oh. you know, like a particular exhibit. And multidimensional recognizes that context matters. Different visitors, different exhibitions, different times of day, these can all influence the overall experience. So it's not just about whether you liked a specific painting. It's about how you felt throughout your entire visit, from the moment you walked in the door to the moment you left. Precisely. Interesting. It considers things like the flow between exhibits, the ambience of the space, you know, even the impact of crowds on your enjoyment. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how do these dimensions translate into an actual survey? Well, the core OER survey question is usually phrased something like, please rate your overall experience with this museum exhibition event today. Okay. So it's kept deliberately simple to try to capture your immediate top of mind reaction. And I bet the placement of that question within a survey matters too. Absolutely. It's typically placed right at the beginning. Interesting. To avoid swaying your opinion before you have a chance to reflect on your overall experience. So clever. Yeah. Now let's talk about the rating scale itself. The OER uses a five point scale, poor, fair, good, excellent, and superior. Why these specific terms, and what is the significance of having superior at the top? So the scale is designed to be truly ordinal, meaning each level is clearly better than the one before. Mm -hmm. Now, excellent sounds pretty positive. Yeah. But research has shown it can actually be a bit of a trap. Oh. Hmm. How so? People tend to gravitate towards excellent because it's a safe, positive choice. Yeah. That doesn't imply any criticism, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily mean they were blown away by their experience. Interesting. So excellent might be masking some truly enthusiastic visitors who would have given an even higher rating if they had the option. That's exactly why superior is so crucial. It provides a way for those truly passionate visitors to express just how much they loved their experience. Okay. And that gives the museum valuable insight into what truly resonates with their audience. So it's not just about getting a bunch of excellent ratings. It's about understanding the nuances. Within those ratings mm -hmm. and identifying the experiences that truly spark enthusiasm. Right. And that's where the Denver Zoo study comes in. Okay. They conducted this really fascinating experiment using their online exit surveys uh -huh. to see how adding a category above excellent impacted responses. Wait, I love a good data-driven experiment. Tell me more about this Denver Zoo study. So they randomly assigned visitors to one of five different response scales. Okay. Some had superior at the top, while others used terms like outstanding or very good, all measuring the same concept of overall experience. So same question, different answer choices. Exactly. What did they find? The results were 
quite striking. Okay. Adding a category above excellent dramatically shifted the distribution of responses. Interesting. When excellent was the highest option, it naturally attracted the most responses. Yeah. But when there was an even better option available, like superior or outstanding, fewer people chose excellent. So people were forced to really consider whether their experience was truly top tier or just really good. Exactly. It challenges our assumptions about what a good rating even means. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And this has significant implications for how museums interpret visitor feedback. A high percentage of excellent responses might not tell the whole story. Wow, that's a real eye-opener. But what does it all mean for museums in a practical sense? Well, it suggests that the scales with superior or outstanding are likely more accurate in identifying those truly enthusiastic visitors. Okay. The ones who are most likely to become repeat visitors, spread the word, and even become active supporters. Makes sense. Those passionate visitors are the real gems for any museum. Absolutely. And the Smithsonian Institution has been using the OER across its museums since 2004, accumulating this vast amount of data Wow. that further supports this idea. Okay, I'm all ears. What have they learned from all that data? So across hundreds of studies and millions of visitors, they consistently find a similar distribution of OER ratings. Roughly 0.3% choose poor or fair, about 20-30% choose good, around 50% choose excellent, and then about 20% land on superior. So excellent really is that anchor point you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But the real insights come from those ratings above and below it. You got it. And what's particularly revealing is that the percentage of superior and less than excellent ratings can vary quite a bit. Okay. Depending on the specific museum or the exhibition and other factors. So museums can use this data to track how they're doing over time and identify areas for improvement. Precisely. For example, the Smithsonian's Free Sackler Galleries. Yeah. They actually used OER data to discover that their exhibitions weren't receiving as many superior ratings as they used to. Wow. And it prompted them to make changes to enhance the visitor experience. And it worked. And it worked. That's a great example of data-driven decision-making in action. What other insights can museums glean from the OER? Well, they can segment OER results by visitor type. Okay. Like first-time versus repeat visitors, members versus non-members, to see if different groups are having different experiences. Yeah, it makes sense. This helps museums tailor their offerings and ensure everyone feels welcome and engaged. So it's about understanding the nuances of the visitor experience and using that knowledge to create a more personalized and enriching experience for everyone. Exactly. That's brilliant. But I'm guessing no system is perfect, right? Are there any limitations to the OER? Of course. One challenge is that highly targeted audiences, you know, like those who come specifically for a particular temporary exhibit, might be more inclined to give higher ratings. So museums need to compare different visitor subgroups to get a more accurate picture of the overall experience. Exactly. And sample size can also be an issue. Okay. Smaller museums might struggle to gather enough responses to achieve statistically significant results. But you mentioned that they can collect data over time to build a more reliable baseline. Right. It's all about using the data thoughtfully and understanding its nuances. Now, while the OER is gaining traction in the museum world, you might be familiar with another metric used in other industries, the Net Promoter Score, or NPS. Yes. NPS is widely used by businesses to gauge customer loyalty and predict growth. So how does it work, and could it be a good fit for museums? That's a great question. So NPS is based on a single question. How likely is it that you would recommend this museum exhibition event to a friend or family member? Okay, sounds simple enough, but I have a feeling there's more to this story. Is NPS really a good fit for the museum world? Well, while NPS might be useful in some contexts, um, there are some pretty strong arguments against using it for museums. Oh, tell me more. Why wouldn't NPS be a good fit for museums? For one thing, NPS focuses on loyalty. Okay. Which isn't really the same for museums as it is for, say, products or services. Okay. Visiting one museum doesn't preclude you from enjoying others. You can be a fan of multiple museums without any conflict. Ah, so you can have multiple museum memberships and still be excited about visiting different institutions. Oh, thank that you. That makes sense. Exactly. And research has actually suggested that for museums, NPS doesn't reliably predict growth. Uh -huh even though that's, you know, a key selling point in other sectors. Interesting. So just because someone says they'd recommend a museum, it doesn't mean they'll actually convince their friends to go or that the museum will see an increase in attendance. Yeah, that's what the data seems to indicate. Another issue is that NPS scores vary wildly across different industries. Oh. 
making comparisons almost meaningless. A high NPS for a tech company doesn't tell you anything about how that score compares to a museum's NPS. So it's like comparing apples to oranges. You can't really draw any meaningful conclusions from those comparisons. Exactly. And there's even evidence that NPS isn't great at predicting repeat visits, which is, of course, something museums care about a great deal. They want you to come back again and again. Of course. Building those lasting relationships with visitors is key for any museum. Absolutely. And that's why comparing NPS to OER is so revealing. Okay. The Denver Zoo study we discussed earlier actually looked at this directly. Yeah. They compared NPS results side by side with OER, and the findings highlight some key differences between the two metrics. Okay, let's dive back into that Denver Zoo data. What did they find when they compared NPS and OER? So the NPS distribution was heavily skewed towards the promoter category. Okay. Those who are highly likely to recommend the zoo. However, and this is the important part, many of those promoters didn't actually rate their experience as superior on the OER scale. Wait, so they were willing to recommend the zoo to others, but didn't necessarily have an outstanding experience themselves. Yeah. That seems counterintuitive. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. And when we look at the statistical analysis, it supports this disconnect. There's a low shared variance between NPS and OER, meaning they're measuring different aspects of the experience. So the takeaway here is that OER seems to be better at capturing the true level of enthusiasm visitors feel, while NPS might be a bit too broad and doesn't quite get to the heart of what makes a museum visit memorable. That's a great summary. NTS, with its focus on recommendation, might not be the most effective tool for museums to really understand what truly resonates with their visitors and drives engagement. This has been such an insightful deep dive into the world of museum visitor research. We've uncovered the power of the OER, the limitations of NPS, and how seemingly simple choices in survey design can reveal so much about visitor perceptions. Yeah, it all boils down to this. Creating truly meaningful museum experiences requires a deep understanding of what visitors value and how those values translate into tangible outcomes like repeat visits and active support. And that understanding benefits everyone, museums, visitors, and society as a whole. Absolutely. When museums thrive, we all benefit from the knowledge and the inspiration and the cultural enrichment that they provide. But before we wrap up, I want to leave you with a final thought-provoking question. Yeah, that's a great question to leave us with. Um, but, you know, something that really struck me in this deep dive is how easily our perceptions can be swayed by, you know, these subtle factors like how a question is phrased in a survey. Oh, that's a great point. And it's actually a fascinating area of study. Yeah. And, you know, it highlights how important it is to be aware of the potential biases in any research, even something as seemingly straightforward as a visitor survey. Yeah, it makes you think twice about those multiple choice options, what they're really trying to measure. Exactly. For example, imagine a survey that asks, how satisfied were you with your visit? Okay. Versus how dissatisfied were you? Oh, I see what you mean. The first question subtly nudges me to focus on the positive right. aspects of my experience, while the second one might make me dwell on you know, any minor complaints, even if my overall impression was positive. Exactly. The wording of the question can kind of subtly shift our attention and ultimately influence how we evaluate our experience. You know, it highlights the importance of careful survey design and the need to consider those potential biases when you're interpreting the results. It's like those optical illusions mm -hmm. where the same image can be perceived in two completely different ways, yeah. depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Our perceptions are so easily influenced. It's a great analogy, and it underscores why understanding these nuances is so important. You know, both for museums trying to gather accurate feedback and for us as individuals navigating a world that's full of information and persuasion. Yeah, it's all about being more mindful and critical, not just taking things at face value. Absolutely. Questioning assumptions, <laughs> considering different perspectives, being aware of those subtle influences. You know, these can help us form more informed opinions and make more thoughtful choices. Well said. Yeah. This deep dive has given me a whole new appreciation for the complexities of the museum experience. It's not just about the exhibits themselves. It's about this you know, intricate interplay of design and perception and individual preferences. And at the end of the day, it's about fostering a love of learning, yeah. sparking curiosity, creating those superior moments that stay with us long after we've left the museum. Beautifully put. So dear listeners, next time you visit a museum, remember, you're not just a passive observer, you're an active participant right. in this dynamic cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. Be curious, be engaged, and let your voice be heard. Your feedback is so valuable. 
And it helps shape the future of these incredible institutions. And until next time, keep diving deep. <laughs>